What's going on, spectators? We're back for another special video for you. I'm Brooklyn. I'm here with my boy, Hondro. How you doing? Doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. We're joined today by a special guest working for the Kansas City Chiefs game day operations assistant, Joey Bernard. How you doing, bro? Good. I'm doing great, guys. Thank you for having me on. How are y'all? We're doing great. Thank All you good. for joining us. It's a pleasure. I am excited. <laughs> Yes, sir. So I was a little bit salty at the Bengals for taking my team <laughs> out of it. Of kind of, you know, ruined my season plans, you know. So. <laughs> but the game was uh, um, not what we thought it was going to be. You know, both teams were very high-powered offenses this year, and we got a 23-20 to 20 outcome, not what we expected from, you know, what the Rams and the Bengals have been doing offensively all, all season and the postseason. But mm -hmm. I think overall we ended up getting a really good finish for a Super Bowl. Absolutely. And like you said, going into it, I think everybody expected a shootout. Yeah. I was thinking more of whatever defense stood up at the end would win kind of yeah. thing. Defense right. with championships. And I mean, that's what there, was going. There you that's go with Aaron, with Aaron yeah. Donald. There you go. Aaron Donald was a monster. Yeah, he – I think he should have got the defensive MVP – or got the MVP for uh, the Super Bowl, but – uh, I don't know. I, I guess you could hold the weight with those last uh, two plays for him, but uh, Cooper Cup, man, you can't go wrong with that. Uh, you can't. He he deserved to be league MVP, but he's not a quarterback, so giving him Super Bowl MVP is good enough, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Second prize, I guess. Second best yeah. prize. Yeah. Okay, I can't be mad at that. And like you said, it ruined your plans. Unfortunately, the the Chiefs get knocked out. But we'll, we'll get into um, your role that you play with the Chiefs uh, yourself. But let's backtrack a little bit. How'd you get into football? Well, what brought you to love the game? And uh, did you play it back in the day? And how, how was your yeah. relationship with that? Yes, yeah, so I was born and raised in Texas. And, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's football. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. That's football country right there. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm here from the Dallas area. Where, um, so, you know, Dallas guy was growing up, born in the 90s, and they're all the hype. So, I mean, you couldn't go around or even, like, grow up without knowing what football was down here. And so, fell in love with it at an early age. I actually didn't meet – I actually really didn't even play until middle school. Really? Um, yeah, just moving around and stuff. And I, don't know, I, just, I liked watching it more than anything, than, you know, participating. But then it was like – I moved to a small country town and that's all they had was football. So it was like, if you wanted to be, to know anybody, have friends with anybody, you had to play. Yeah. So I went from this big city of really didn't matter if you played or not to, Hey, you want to be part of something, go play football. So I did. And I fell in love with it the first day we put pads on. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, playing football and, you know, in the Mecca of, you know, states of football in the small towns where you see, your Friday night lights, stuff like that, you know, so it's, you know, very, being part of that was really cool, and it's, it's kind of shot up from there, and just following, um, and then Tony Romo just gave me a totally another, you know, level of loving football, watching him play the sport, so that's just kind of where my football love started. That's awesome, and playing high school football, and Pee Wee football in Texas, that must be insane. Some of those high school stadiums also are, like, NFL stadiums yeah. and college stadiums. Like you said, Friday Night Lights style. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, like, in, in my district alone, Deion Sanders is you – know, kids played in Prosper, Texas. That's where they started. He had his own – it's his, it's a Kroger now, but his house is right there in the middle of Prosper, and he had the practice field back there, and he built the first Astro field, AstroTurf field for a high school team. I got to – I didn't play on that field since I was in eighth grade, and we were playing Deion Sanders kids. Oh, wow. That's awesome. So from uh, playing as a kid and growing up in middle school and all that, what kind of, how did you transition from playing to more roles into where you're at now into the NFL? Like follow your dream of playing into a new dream or something like that? So definitely um, I played offensive line. I'm 5'9". You're not going anywhere 5'9 to play football. So uh, from so from there, I really wanted to, be, I really got into sports, wanted to be a sports broadcasting. And in high school, small, I was told by my counselor, you'd be lucky enough to hold a camera at the Friday night games for a local news station. So I was like, oh, wow. all right. Wow. Straight to the point. Yeah. Wow. So, so so my football dreams were just like, well, I'm just going to be a huge fan. Because, like, I think I got into, like, literally every Monday, 
I, I was the stats guy. Like I was like, I, was, uh-huh. I could tell you exactly what happened to every single game all weekend. I was like, I really got into it. And I love talking about it, like how we are today mm-hmm. right now. Absolutely. Um, so I didn't really think much of it once you know I would kind of got shot down. I joined the military. I was in the military for for, uh, for four years. And when I was getting close to the end of my four-year contract, stolen, uh, a buddy of mine was like, you know, because this is when podcasts were getting popular. Like, you know, you live in YouTube and all that. Like, why don't you, you know, why don't you do that yourself? You know, you, you sound so professional when you're talking about it. You really love it. Why don't you try it yourself? So it really started kind of what y'all are doing. I started, I was, it was, it's not a thing anymore, so it's not really a plug, but the fan box with Joey B. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, and I started doing 30 minute YouTube videos and eventually it turned into a podcast that went on for three or four years. I love doing it. Um, and so like I, that, that was my, that was my goal is my drive. Like, I'm going to go to the army and I was, I'm going to go pursue that. Mm-hmm. Well, got the army, got married. Oh, got to start a family. Got to, got to, got to make, you know, again, kind of put it off to the side uh, once again, but then I started selling cars and I hated it. Like I did, it was really good for two years, hated the hours. And I'm like, what can I do with my skill set that I've learned from the army from becoming a salesperson? What can I do now? And it was like, um, I, it came operations and public relations. And I was like, can you do that in sports? So I started plugging that in. I was like, oh, you need a degree. So I was like, I'm going to use my job bill. I'm going to go to school. And literally what got me into sports operations, what I'm doing now is, my very last day at selling cars, um, I the day before I helped this I helped, I helped this woman look at like eight different cars. I was with her all freaking day, and she was like, "I'm gonna send my husband in." Ended up being uh, he's the chief operations officer of the Blue Gray All American Bowl, Sean Siglinski. and he comes in and we're just talking football the you know the whole time. I sell him two cars on my, which is not like a it was a kind of a rare thing on my very last day. And he's like, why are you going to stop? And I told him I love sports, the football. And he's like, hey, three months, we got the Blue Green All-American Bowl at ATT Stadium in Dallas. Why don't you come intern for a day? Wow. And so well, I went there. And then that's when I just, like, learned, like, football was more than your X's and the O's and mm-hmm. the stats and the talking about. It. There's so much more that goes into every game um, and every practice and every combine. There's just so much more behind it. And if you, you're not an athlete, because, you know, we all know there's only 32 head coaching jobs in the NFL. And then from there, you you know, it, it, it sprinkles down. There's not like, – the market is small. Yeah. And there's a lot more out there that people don't know about. And I learned about it because with the Blue Gray American Bowl, you have all these 90s, you know, football players like uh, George Teague and Mark McMillan and Ken Stills, like guys like that that – had been around the league and they can't even get coaching jobs in the league, but they opened my eyes like, Hey, there's way more than just coaching. If you really want to be part of this league. And I just put my work ethic into it. And I became from, I climbed my way from an intern to administrative um, operations assistant. Uh, Now uh, it's only seasonally, but I'm the football operations manager for blueberry football and the coordinator for the combines in the Southwest region for Blue Gray All American Bowl. And so with that on my resume and all that, and I was like, you know, I was going to school, I've been going to school, but also I've been, I was, I was working a full-time job, keeping stuff up, you know, keep it, you know, with the family and my wife and everything. And um, due to COVID, the, what I was doing, the business started shutting down. I didn't know what to do. And I was like, so, and so I'm like, what are your resume? Look at all that sports stuff. Like, why are yeah. you doing all this other non sports <laughs> things right now? I was like, well, I don't have a group, my degree yet. And it's like, so you have so much experience. Like, why don't you go chase something? And I actually got connected with the VP of business operations for the Tennessee Titans um, through my old bosses at the company that, that kind of fell apart. I had a 30 minute conversation with him and my whole outlook on the sports world changed again. If you really want to do this, and this is for anybody listening or anything, if you really want to do this, go out, go, go out there, find it. And you just apply, 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 you know? And that's what I did. I literally, he told me uh, where I could, you, and it's not hard. You just literally go to teams websites and you can find out where they post their jobs at. And I found like the place where most NFL teams post their jobs at. And I mean, it, it's jobs all the way from 
do you want to mow the lawns at Arrowhead to ticket takers to, you know, all the way to, you know, to their higher up things like the more they hire their VP of business development and stuff like that. And so I'm, I mean, well, I've had kind of thought and it's like Dallas, obviously where we live is like kind of the sports Mecca for, for right now. Cause I mean, we had, you name a sport, we have a pro or a semi pro or triple A team for that sport. Mm-hmm. But there was literally, I was literally not finding anything. I was in the pond, but I was swimming, couldn't find nobody. And so literally, I was like, I have family in Kansas City. I have family in Seattle. Carolina is cool. Like, I, I, we set a list and I applied to Kansas City and not thinking of anything of it, really. So I was like, ah, oh, whatever. And then I got interviewed and I actually, it's funny, I applied for the wrong job because <laughs> really? the, descri- the description, is very fancy and it was like guest services representative or something like that but what it is is an usher for game day is what like, I like the ones for. that uh, go up and down the aisles go up and down the aisles yeah <laughs> oh man <laughs> and I was like oh well and I went there I was like gonna end the interview and I was like oh well I'm sorry this is not what I thought this was and like hold on no 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 we saw your resume with the football operations with blue gray football and and we actually have a new role coming into our event and game day operations team wow and they're like would you be interested in that and i was like uh yeah for sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> give me that yeah and so that's kind of that's just kind of where like that's the story of how i got there and it's it, game day operations is a lot it's a lot more than just uh there's a lot that goes into having a game and every game is a separate event. Anybody that's in like rec or, you know, city management or whatever, they know it, it's just, everything's just a big event really. And that's what the game day operations side is. And it's like a non, it's, I don't know. I don't want to speak too much. To I'll let y'all ask more questions. I feel like I've been talking a while. But yeah. <laughs> no, we, we love it. So <laughs> keep it going. Keep it going. But, um, yeah, I didn't know that story about uh, how you met Sean. We, me and Joey have known each other for about like three, four years now, working with Sean as well. So that that's really cool. And I've seen how it all goes down with game day operations with Blue Gray. And for uh, All-American Bowl for high school level, that that's pretty tedious and everything that goes into that is pretty stressful. So kind of take us through a day in the life of being – that for the Kansas City Chiefs. Well, what are some of the things that you have to deal with? So with Kansas City Chiefs, I'll just start off. Um, so we're, for the role I had this year for this season, I worked the Thursday and Friday before before game day for the home games, mm-hmm. and then I worked then I worked game day, and then you worked the two days afterwards. Mm-hmm. So uh, game day, I'd say the game. So it's it's weird. If the game's at three twenty five, we got we had to be there at 8 a.m. Mm-hmm. Or I guess 425 for y'all because we're just um, – so we'd have to be there at 8 our time, 9 y'all's time. But if it was a primetime game, we had to be there even earlier. Makes sense. Because the, it, the NFL has these rules on when food's supposed to be prepared and cooked. And if it's a night game, the food and stuff has to be prepared 12 hours before. So and then I and then part of game of part of what I do is setting up employee check in people to check into the stadium and get make sure the right credentials where they're going that day and stuff like that. So I was I was part of going around and setting that and setting that up and checking the people in. So I was there either sometimes four a.m., five a.m., six a.m. depending on what else we had going for that game. But I mean, so I would be there. I mean way before you would think someone needs to be at that stadium for a primetime game. Um, but so, it, so an Arrowhead is very, is unique to, I want to say very unique, but it's outside. Um, and there's a lot more, a uh, lot more weather in Missouri than, uh, than most states, especially down there in Florida for y'all. I know y'all, got, y'all get your rain, but we have the wind and the snow and the ice. And then, like, oh, is it is going to be hot? Because the first two games of the season were actually like, hot. They weren't just, like, cool weather games. Um, and so, like, going that specifically, especially towards the end of the season, we had to bring in these trailers for check-ins and for, like, you know, when you're tailgating and stuff, and, like, that's where you're going to be the whole game, but you mm-hmm. need 
the but the teams have their ambassadors or what their fan services out there like we help we had to make sure they're set up make sure they have all their supplies so that we're taking care of all the fans of chief's kingdom so i run around to each trailer or each tent depending what the time of year is make sure they have everything they need wow. um before they even get there so hopefully they're not asking by the time they're already clocked in and getting ready to work. Mm. I, I, co- I come in, and it's crazy. Like, literally, uh, for the uh, game versus the Buffalo Bills, I, I had to be there at, at, at 4.30 a.m. I'm coming through the gates, and, and there's people already tailgating in, in line to get into the stadium parking lot. Oh, that's at 4.30 how, a.m. At 4.30 a.m. Wow. They were already cooked. You smelled the bacon. They, had, they were cooking. People were already drinking. Like they were getting ready to. They were tailgating to tailgate. <laughs> and so, very unique up there with Chiefs Kingdom, and obviously the Bills fans too. You know, that's just quite the mixture of people. Two great but, fan bases. Oh, for sure. And so once I started again, checked in, and then I'm running around in a golf cart directly through the stadium. Uh, and so we have fan service booths and all that within the stadium as well. You know, with customer relations, however, every stadium is different. They call it something different because every team wants to be unique from every other team, but it's the same uh, job and whatever. So go around, make sure everybody's got first aid kits, sensory kits, your ear plugs for, you know, for the, for kids, your hand warmers, bottles of water, uh, memorabilia that they hand out at different at different zones and then a cool thing I got to be part of was called the field pass this year and and if you've seen Jackson Mahomes and Brittany Mahomes on the field before their games doing their TikToks and whatnot uh-huh. uh, that's what kind of what I was helping and in charge of with those zones for the friends and family the players to come down on the field before the game um and so you have so there's two zones for the home team and then there's three zones on the uh, away team now those three zones over on the way side were what i was in charge of and that's friends of families of the opposing team agents from players on both sides um and then your lucky fans that paid you know that they paid to be down there but they paid a little extra to be down there and it's just setting up the logistics of that of the you know you saw the you know the yellow chains that are always around them on TV and stuff. And so I set that up, make sure everybody's in the right, correct zones, make sure everybody's not not talking to you, they shouldn't be talking to or messing with the uh, with the camera crews and stuff. ESPN is the worst company to work with when it comes to <laughs> sharing field space. Really? Yeah, because they think ESPN owns the field and they don't. Mm-hmm. You know, the Chiefs <laughs> own the field. The Chief, we, we set that up. Like, that's ours. You weren't at the meeting to say we needed this. I'll just show up and try to take what you need. And that's that's not how it works. Mm-hmm. Um, but – and that's always cool, especially during the primetime games. And the Chiefs, as of late with their success, have had, got a lot of primetime games, got flexed into a primetime game. So, I had a lot of long days starting at 4 a.m. going until, you know, 1 or 2 a.m. the next day. Yeah. Um. And so then that's right. So right before kickoff, right, the teams go in and then, you know, we get everybody off the field. And so then like, I call that my uh, almost my relaxed time. I go, I find my favorite part of the stadium. Sometimes it's low, sometimes it's high. And I watch them, them the teams come out, the national anthem and all that stuff. And what's cool with the Chiefs is when they're seeing the national anthem, you get the land of the free and home of the, and everybody yells, Cheers! Mm-hmm. And it's like an earthquake inside that stadium. Like one man, of the loudest stadiums in the league, too. So I know hold, the atmosphere must be insane. They hold the record for loudest stadium in the world, 142.3 oh, wow. decibels. Oh, yeah, there you go. And they're very proud of that because they have the whole decibel up. Let's get loud. Like, <laughs> um, and then so from there, and when you when you go to a game and you someone's working at the concession stand, more than likely those people do not work for the Chiefs in any type of way whatsoever. Most of them are or any for any team, uh, really they're they're called uh, MPOs, nonprofit organization volunteers. So these uh, like Boy Scouts, baseball teams, a school band, whatever, they volunteer to work the concession stands or ticket sale or the ticket tell they scan your tickets let you in stuff like that they come and volunteer and the 
they log their hours and depending on how many hours they work, the chiefs will donate a certain amount of money back for those hours. So part of what, so part of event and game day operations is finding those volunteers, getting, finding out how many you need, get, get, reaching out to all these different organizations to make sure you have everybody and then being able to supply them with a free meal ticket for once they're done with their duty and then they get to go stand and watch the game somewhere and also policing them make sure they're not trying to steal seats they're in the way like yeah it can be a lot and especially when we do giveaways you know, when you go into a ballpark and it's bobblehead day or whatever we're in charge of setting that up as well so when the every playoffs there was some kind of giveaway it was a towel a koozie something so setting the logistics of that up was, was on us as well and then hiring the extra 150 volunteers you need to hand them out and then going once everybody's in the stadium and going collecting any extras and inventorying it all and storing it away for the rest of the game. So usually by halftime, I'm finally done. I just have to kind of wait and see if there's any fires to be put out. And I get to watch, I always get to watch the second half of every game. And then after that, it's immediately regress of the fans coming out, uh, you know, leaving all club levels. It's an NFL rule. If you're in the club level, you get to stay one hour once the game is over. So we're kind of just sitting and waiting for those fans to clear out. And once the fans are cleared out and uh, like for cold weather games, we hand out heated jackets to all the employees. So that's part of my job. I actually, for the Chiefs this year, built the inventory physically and inside the computer of these new coats that we got and assigned them to everybody. And they got a certain tag number. Then I'm, I, I help the, uh, um, uniform staff make sure everybody turns them all in and then put them back how they need to go and we have our post-game meetings and post-game meetings usually are quick but this year they weren't so quick by what I understood because this is the first year after COVID but mm-hmm. we had 100% capacity so people are acting a full all season long of course so if mm-hmm. there's a, any uh like we had to listen to the captains for all the different sections of ushers and stuff we had this issue, we had that issue to kind of go through kind of listen report of, you know, how many arrests were there, what kind of incidents do we have? And then uh, just if anything's important, but everybody, you know, at the end of the day, you like to complain about how your day was. So we're just kind of sitting and listening, letting them all complain, like, I'll go home. Like, you know, <laughs> I want to go home. <laughs> Y'all can all put this in your reports that we can read on Monday. Yeah. And then the not so fabulous part of the job is being in charge of lost and found. Mm. <laughs> because ultimately it's security, but they're they only reunite the fans with their lost stuff. We're the ones that have to go and collect it from because with the customer service, everybody goes to those booths, they drop that stuff off at the booth, and then we go through it right after the game, see if there's anything critical or if we can take that we need to get back to someone that night if possible. Um, because of COVID though, like there's a lot of stuff we throw away if it's closed now and if it's a nice jacket, unless we think it's really nice, we want to be nice, we end up just throwing it away. We don't usually hold on to it. And then, um, kind of sorting that out, putting it in the safe place until next week where we start, uh, trying to reunite the fans with it. And like with technology these days, you know, you lost something, you go to the Chiefs website, you put in a ticket, and then that comes to us. And we try to, you know, buy your best description, try to find your item, call you and see if it's your item, and kind of reunite the fans with it. It's not wow. the glorious side of it all, but, wow. um, but yeah, and with I'm, the cool part, I totally skipped over on that field pass. I'm walking on the field right there with the players. Um, took in, I took pictures of every opposing team. I have tons of pictures on my phone that I, I cherish forever especially when the Cowboys came because I'm a huge Cowboys fan. So that was awesome. That My first season with the Chiefs, they came to Arrowhead. Um, Travis Kelsey is on a nickname basis with me. He calls me Big Dog. Really? And, actually, like, we're, and I'm shocked that he remembers me because there's no reason to remember me. Like, I'm not that important whatsoever. But my first game was against the Browns. He was doing a corner route. And he ran past me when you know, did his thing with the fans. And as he was running back on the field, he accidentally ran into me. And uh, I did my best not to fall down, you know, you know, trying to be uh-huh. cool. And then he, he kind of, he's like, oh, sorry, big dog. 
And I was like, oh, yeah, no problem, man. And then he's like, he's like, uh, put a smile on your face. I guess I was just nervous. So I wasn't smiling. Uh-huh. Next next home game, he sees me again. He's like, what's up, big dog? You came back. And I was like, yeah. So it's like, <laughs> all right, that's, that's a pretty cool thing. That and then is I got, awesome. I, I got this uh, signed helmet from Patrick Mahomes. Oh, <laughs> snap. That is yeah. sick. That's amazing. So, I mean, that's, that's a game day for an event, game day operations assistant. He, he hit pretty much everything, everything. I wanted to, <laughs> wanted to ask. Yeah. So, I guess give us, like, besides the Travis uh, interaction, because that's pretty cool, but give us your favorite and biggest moment during your time and your most stressful, because I know this is your first year on the job. Things don't always go smoothly. It, it's the right. nature of the the job. So give us the most stressful thing that had you like, oh man, well, <laughs> how, how am I getting out of this one? <laughs> so the most stressful thing was, so the Cowboys game was our highest attendance. Uh-huh. Um, because Cowboys fans travel well. A lot yeah. of them already live there. And then the Cowboys themselves brought I, I don't. I'm gonna make up a number because I don't remember the number. It was like the top 10 percent of season ticket holders. They brought them to the game. Really? <laughs> they brought in their whole front office. They brought their version of our team. Like they brought everybody. And so it was like the most attended NFL game or Chiefs game for the season. It still was even with the even compared to the playoff ones. It was the numbers were crazy. And so. And it was, it was chilly, but not too chilly. So people were able to enjoy themselves, have a good time. So just in, the incidents were super high. We had one uh, set of, of volunteers not show up. So we were 35 volunteers short. Oh, my goodness. And they were supposed to be in charge of the wheelchairs. Oh. Who needs a wheelchair? You know, following people around wheelchairs. So we – so we had to scramble for that. And like I said, so the field, the field zone was, on the field was super packed. Jerry Jones was walking around like he didn't care who was down there. And that's like a huge security threat. Um, and so you just never know like what was going on at all times. And we, we had to set up a breakfast before because like, especially when you have a certain amount of people coming in early, it's with my my boss like it was a courteous thing and so i had to go into dunkin donuts like outside of the stadium and we put an order in but they didn't get the order and so and that was like so i'm there so it makes me look bad because i didn't check yeah. before but it was just like we had trusted them all season when we did these kind of things mm. and so i'm rushing to get this, this this done there's only one worker there for that early in the morning and so I get there. I'm late with it. Everybody's all peed off. They have their, you know, their, their donuts and coffee. Like, it's not that big of a deal, but it's like <laughs> they've been treated like that every single game. So it's something that's totally, you know, expected. They need to have it. Yeah. Um, and so, and then, we didn't, and then the Cowboys version of our team wanted to shadow us all day. And because the parent, because like, I don't know the logistics of it all, but it's like the Chiefs always finish top 10 of fan experience. And the mm. Cowboys don't. The Cowboys also have like 35,000 more people in their stadium than the, than the Chiefs do. But they just want to see things that we did. And that was super stressful because it's like, oh, that's the team I like. This team, like, I, these guys are from where I'm from and they're watching me do my thing. And, and they kind of got in the way a little bit too because yeah. they don't know where they're going. And we were doing a scarf, um, a scarf giveaway that day because it was the first cold weather game of the season. And it and like and we were supposed to have all those extra volunteers that we didn't have that hand out the scarfs and to be there for the wheelchairs. And that's all. So when that happens, that that type, like any when I was telling you I put any fires, that's what we do. Like if there were short on staff or something we're filling in and there's only three of us we have we have one intern we have the coordinator and then the, me the assistant and we're running rampant and there's so many incidents and we're like anytime is that you know if you if you come upon something happening you have to take care of it. you can't just walk away or call somebody else mm -hmm. so you walk in on a fight you got to be the first responder and do what you got to do 
someone's puking, dying, drunk, passed out, you got to take care of it. And there was just so much of that. Like, I didn't get to watch any of the Cowboys games whatsoever. Oh, man. And you can usually watch, like, the second half, she said? I get to watch the second half. I didn't get to watch any of it. My oh. family came My family came up. I got to see them for a hot second right when they were doing National Anthem because they came to the game and everything. And it, that was that was the most stressful, I think, because especially on the field pass with everybody down there and my phone's blowing up. Security is like, what do we do? You know, he's just doing it. I was like, do you want to tell Jerry Jones you can't go over there? No. <laughs> I'm not going to do that either. No. <laughs> uh, it's like the Jones kids, they don't have they don't have their wristbands on. So we exactly <laughs> knew no they are by who their face is. Leave it alone. Let them, <laughs> let them do what they're doing. But I said the Cowboys game was the most stressful. And I would like I got there super early. That's probably the latest night besides the primetime game that I had too was, was the Cowboys game. Wow. Wow. And uh, real quick, just give us uh, one of your favorite moments after that stressful one. Yeah, <laughs> right. So my favorite moment was the Bills playoff game. Uh, everybody, the divisional round. Yeah. It was because so I um, I got my cousin a job there as an usher, and he had he had his section is that corner of the end zone where the Chiefs ended that game, and I stayed and I watched the whole fourth quarter from there, mm-hmm. and um. And obviously it was, a, it was an awesome game. Like I, I told myself because I was, I knew I wasn't going to be at the AFC Championship game because of uh, my priority was Blue Gray for the for the Tampa game. Um, so I was like, this is my last game of the season at home. I'm going to be a fan for the whole second half, and I was. I enjoyed it. It was amazing. They let me be, and then I, I have the video of the game winning, game winning play in overtime. The game, the game tying field goal to go to overtime. Like, I've never, and everybody says like that was one of the best games of football that we've all seen in a very long time with the Houston Bills, mm-hmm. and it was just such a, like crazy experience. It's just a football fan period being there and watching and being that close, being right there in that corner, seeing Jarvis Kelsey catch that ball. That was my, that was my favorite moment by far. And staying on that game, if you don't mind, since you were there and the watching everything, can you kind of run through? kind of the atmosphere of everything with the 13 seconds left being down the three plays the field goal overtime coin toss everything like that just from a fan in the stadium perspective so we thought we had it locked we thought we had it locked up at like the two so right right when after that fan ran on the field around the two minute mark yeah we thought well this is over they have two minutes left our defense is going to stand still because we because Tyreek Hill had that huge huge play to, to take the lead like there's no way you know we had a momentum and where they do score with 13 seconds left and i mean dead quiet the whole stadium we're really? all it's done i even said i was like you know what because i was about to go run up i'm like we're about to do degress like this is over but i was like no i'm gonna stay i'll wait till the clock is zero then i'll i'm gonna, I'm gonna run up um but it was silent even the bills fans are around us were like oh sorry guys like they were, they had their excitement when they scored, but other than that, they kind of like let us sit in yeah. our resentment. Like, like I never heard it that quiet. Besides yeah. when nobody's there, that's yeah. how quiet it was. Really? And uh, yeah, and we're just like, wow. And then we got kind of excited for that first big play that that got us to the, almost midfield. And I was like, there's still there's not enough. There's still not enough time. There's still not enough time. And then that play to Kelsey to get in field goal range, mm-hmm. you, you'd have thought that play won us the game because everybody lost their minds. Like, oh my god! Like it was like the going. That was another thing. The emotion of going up to all the way yeah. down to going right back up, and then taking his butt curve missed a field goal earlier in the game. So this wasn't even guaranteed. It was a fifty-yard field goal, yeah. and he boom it makes it. We're all going crazy again. Da, da, da. I'm not even thinking. You know, we need to win the coin toss. I'm just like, oh my gosh, we're lucky to be going into overtime right now. Yeah. I was like, I thought Mar- their season was done, my team was done. This sucks. It's over. And now it's like nail biting, and we're just waiting. It's like, come on with the coin toss. And we got the we won the coin toss. Um, literally, someone told me right before, like Josh Allen's on the feed on coin tosses. I was like, <laughs> right. I'm superstitious. <laughs> oh my god, crap! Oh, like he's gonna win this one then for sure. 
And then when he lost it, I was like, ooh. Yeah. I, and everybody was excited, but they're like, ooh, let's see what happens. And then yeah. and then I just had a feeling, yeah, they were already in like pretty close to the to red zone right there, but I just had a feeling that this is a moment to get your phone out. And I usually don't like having my phone out recording stuff. I was like, this is a moment if it happens the next play or two. And I mean, it was really like a good uh, vibe right before they hiked the ball. And I felt like it got quiet for a second. And then it was the loudest, the loudest thing I ever heard. And the explosion, like how loud it was, I literally got goosebumps just from like the noise hitting me. And immediately the fireworks go off. I've and I've never been that excited for a win ever. I'm a huge Cowboys fan, and we, we know we haven't been that far. But I'm never always been excited when they win. But never have been excited for a, a, any game of football for a team to win in that manner. It was the most. I can't explain the feeling to anybody. <laughs> it's just something you have to experience. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's why I was wondering because, like, as we were watching the games, and obviously mm-hmm. it's it's different on TV compared to in the stadium with the roller coaster of emotions. So I can't even imagine how insane that must have been, and such a quick time span too. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. and like the the quick time span of the emotion. Like, I don't think good thing I'm young or my heart would have gave out. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. No, that's that's insane. That, that's a really cool experience. That's something you hold yeah. with for, for the rest of your life. Literally. Because that, yeah, that little bit of the game is going to be played for NFL lore for yeah. years and years. Oh, for sure. And in your first year, you're there too. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why it was just such a disappointing for us not to go all the way. Because at that point, we yeah. thought it was done. We just beat the Bills, who were, we thought were probably the best team in the AFC. We're going all the way. There's no doubt. And then we lose the Bengals the way we did. I mean, it was just like a – and I was in Tampa. And had to go freaking do a ceremony for Blue Gray. And I, I – man, losing – when it's more than just you're a fan of a team, it – like, because you – like, we had – we got – we had to put in our ring sizes for the AC Championship because I wasn't going to be there. I had to send my ring size so they could order it. And knowing that, oh, it doesn't matter anymore because we lost. That was like, oh, oh. like a defeating feel, like so defeating. Yeah. Well, then there's a lot more time. The Chiefs have a very, very good chance to get there again yeah. and again. Um, <laughs> I don't see them lacking anytime soon. But, Joey, we appreciate it a lot. The stories were amazing, bro. You're welcome back anytime. You're a busy man, so we'll we'll let you get out of here. You you got anything else before? Uh, no, go? thank you so much. I I it was really nice to hear that story of you and the yeah. with the Bills game. That was that was so intense. Thank you so much for coming on here today. And uh, you got hey anything guys, else, Joey? No, guys. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, I look forward to you know keep following all throughout. You know, we got the, you know, with everything else going on, and maybe uh, see you all again next football season. Absolutely. And you said you like talking football, so you're welcome anytime to come join us on an episode. We'll we'll get it popping. All right. Sounds good, guys. Thank you. Thank you. sir. Take it easy. And everybody, thank you again for watching. Hit that subscribe button. Leave a like. Follow us on all our socials at underscore the spectators, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And we'll see you guys next time. Peace. Peace.